in the chat so we can all see who is in the virtual room with us. Uh, please remember to keep yourself muted throughout the event, uh, as well as question, questions, <clears throat> excuse me, questions will be pre-selected, or sorry, have been pre-selected from the registration form due to the time constraints. Uh, but we will work to answer any additional questions you may have at a later date. So please do not worry if your question is not addressed at this moment. Uh, there will be time for additional questions towards the end, possibly if we have a little bit of extra leeway there. <laughs> so we encourage participants to have some questions on hand in case there is time. We'll be monitoring the chat box and doing our very best to respond in a timely manner. A quick note, we will be recording this audio as well as uploading this video to YouTube and posting it to our website as well as sharing it all out to you. So keep that in mind throughout this whole video. Now we'll pass it off. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much, Jarell. Um, and if at this time, um, thanks again so much to our legislators. Um, and we'd like to just take this time to have uh, all our legislators joining us um, introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Lou Frederick, uh, State Senator from District 22 North and Northeast Portland. Hi everyone, Representative Teresa Alonso Leon, uh, represent District 22, Whitburn through the north part of Salem. Hello everybody, uh, Mark Meek, uh, representative from House District 40, which is Oregon City, Gladstone, and unincorporated Clackamas County. Happy to be here with you. Ana Sanchez, House District 43, north and northeast Portland. Hi everyone, uh, I'm here from Representative Lauren Spence's office, uh, House District 36, um, uh, which is downtown Portland, including uh, PSU all the way out to Multnomah Village. Hi everyone, this is Cynthia on behalf of Representative Hernandez, House District 47, Outer East Portland. Okay, thank you so much to everyone for your intros and your leadership and for being here. Now, I would like to welcome Senator Frederick, who will be presenting some of the policy proposals, which will be worked on in the upcoming special session. Hello there. I'm sorry, but my, I have a feeling that my um, machine is, that my internet connection is not working yet again. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, I can hear you somewhat. Um, this is, uh, we have, there are, there are a number of proposals that are being presented uh, in the legislature uh, as part of the special session. Uh, they are, uh, they surround about six different basic ideas. One looks at the ability and the, the system for, uh, for the attorney general to take over the role of chief investigator uh, when there is a, a case of use of force or excessive use of force. The second one is, uh, is dealing with the, uh, an arbitration bill that has passed twice out of the Senate unanimously over the last two years. And it will be uh, presented again. It looks as though it has a very good chance of passing. It basically says that an arbitrator cannot go outside the contract, uh, the discipline uh, matrix in a contract in making a decision regarding discipline of a police officer. Second one, um, the third one, uh, deals with the ability for folks to, uh, to talk about what happens if you do not intervene or if you do intervene, uh, if an officer sees a fellow officer or another officer doing something that is uh, inappropriate, um, potentially uh, dangerous, uh, if they, uh, what happens if they intervene or if they do not intervene, and responsibility for that. Uh, a, a fourth one looks at a creating a database of the discipline that uh, officers uh, have across the state so that that database is shareable 
between uh, police uh, departments and available to the public as well. Uh, there's a, there are two others that are more directly in, involved in specific activities. One is to look at uh, the banning of, of toxic gas, tear gas, rubber bullets, et cetera, by a military hardware by the police as they're dealing with, with, uh, with people who are demonstrating peacefully. And the third one is dealing with chokeholds and the, um, the ability for folks to be, um, for, for, for people to suffer from uh, uh, chokeholds and the um, stopping the blood from coming to, to people, uh, outlawing those chokeholds and making it clear that that is something that is not allowed uh, in, as part of a, uh, of a regular system. Part of that will be to, to describe chokeholds as uh, deadly force, and that takes it to a different level. Again, I'm not sure if anybody can hear me or not. I hope they can. I've been talking this whole time, but uh, I'm not. My, my system is um, really screwed up right now. Anyone there? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, you are? Okay. You're the senator. All right, good deal. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, right now, you're, the, the faces on my screen are all frozen, so I couldn't tell whether anyone was hearing me or not. Uh, any questions? Um, thank you, Senator Frederick. We will have some questions that were pre-planned from the audience. Um, and if there are any other questions that came up during the policy proposal um, that Senator Frederick um, was um, announcing, then feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, I will call on the, um, the people who will be asking questions and then we will unmute your mics. So the first person that had a question was Cameron Santiago from LCC. Can everybody hear me? I can, I think, Carmen. Wonderful. Cameron. So uh, my, my question, Senator Frederick, is um, what are there any conversations right now at the state level regarding reallocating resources from policing into like community-based resources? There are significant discussion about um, how we handle uh, what we really want to see in terms of, 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 of public safety. And that includes discussions at various levels, both at the state level and at the uh, at the local uh, police agency level, on how we how we what we're, we're what we're concentrating on regarding police agencies. Uh, we have had uh, the ability on on a broad scale. We have had the approach in police that it says that it's law enforcement that our that the the goal is to go out and enforce the law rather than being peace officers. And so there's, a, there's an, an approach that, that looks at that as a new uh, paradigm uh, as we look at it. Now, that comes down to specific things in that we look at whether we should be uh, allowing the departments to buy military, surplus military equipment because somebody in Lakeview wants to have a, a, an armored personnel carrier or a, uh, some, some ability to have a grenade launcher. Um, so there's, there's some discussion about, as, as Montana has done, uh, saying that, no, you are not going to be buying military surplus military equipment uh, just because you want to have some toys to play with. Um, so we, we, have, we do have that approach. On a, on a much more different level, as you've seen in the city council in Portland, really taking a look at what the police unit is doing and what, what kinds of things they, they need uh, in their in their jobs, what what the community needs, and not so much the police agency, but if you are spending a great deal of time, primarily your time dealing with mental health issues, or uh, domestic violence issues, or other things that are not related to um, arrests and, uh, and 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 dealing with those kinds of things, then we need to start focusing our the money and the time on that particular approach. Having said that, there is also, and I've got to make this very clear, there's also a significant concern that I get from my constituents asking me whether that means that they're going to be safe. If there is somebody, somebody who is, in fact, uh, dangerous, they want to have some kind of connection. They want to have some belief that if they call 
for someone to deal with something that is dangerous, that there'll be someone who is skilled and able to, to arrive and do something about it. Uh, so there's the balance that's taking place there. Uh, and that's what I think I see across the state. And I see certainly in the, in the legislature. The, for the legislature, it's a matter of making sure that we have some sort of accountability because we're not necessarily dealing with um, a day-to-day -day situation, except of course with the Oregon State Police. Uh, and they, they, are, they have their role in a very different way than most of the local police um, departments have. I hope that helps explain some things. Thank you, Senator Frederick. Um, are there any other legislators that would like to chime in on that question? Or I can repeat the question if you would like me to. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Senator Manning here. All right, yeah, thanks, Senator Manning. Um, so the question is, are there currently any, any conversations at the state level regarding reallocation of resources from police to community-based resources? Okay, I uh, well, thank you for this time. I apologize. We just got off one call. I got a 1.30 that was scheduled uh, a week or so ago. Uh, so I'm going to have to pop off around 1.30 to get on to that one. But it's a good question, uh, how we reallocate funds. Uh, I think Senator Fredericks touched on a number of items that I agree with. One of the things that we need to look at is that when we look at uh, systemic change, and we got to look at how we got here. It should not cost you your life to jaywalk in the middle of a residential area uh, and lose your life because you walk across the street to a neighbor. So we're going to have to dig down into some of these uh, 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 these laws that are local uh, at the state level and make sure that we undo all of these things that are that attribute to uh, these. Uh, uh, deadly encounters. For example, when you look at the way uh, some of these officers that I'm talking about the ones that have committed crimes, egregious crimes, uh, they're doing it under the color of law because that's the way the law reads. It permits them. When we, when, we are, when we are looking at this, not only are we looking at how funding are allocated, one is I agree. We have to defund, uh, make sure that we're not defunding, but make sure that we have to get rid of the uh, uh, demilitarized police force. Uh, Senator Fredericks touched on that a bit too. You know, you, you got a small part of 10, 10 people um, and force, and they buy a mine treatment from one of the big defense contractors. Or they're walking around with military style pattern uniforms. Sometimes these individuals have made an attempt to go into the military and didn't qualify. So some of them call back on law enforcement and they go in there with this, I'm going to get the bad guys mentality, not, not realizing that protecting and serving is much different than it is in the military totally different. So I'm also looking at going after these different city codes, uh, these state codes uh, that we have that causes more of the uh, interactions, negative action, and give the, uh, uh, these reactions that are, that are going on under the color of the law. So it is a systematic, a systemic issue, but the laws are out there that you know, when we're looking at the broader picture, we got to focus on the base. I use an analogy like the fire department. When they go in, you know, you, fire, you, you spray your water at the base of the fire, that's where you're going to get more benefit because that it will suffocate the blaze that's above. And then you work your way up. We're approaching this from a holistic way, but we cannot forget how we got here. Those laws that are creating the problem that allow bad officers to hide up under the color of law. Thank you, Senator Manning. Is there any other legislators that would like to chime in on the question? This is Representative Sanchez. Um, I think that one of the things that we're all looking at is different ways that we can maybe, you know, reallocate funds throughout the state. We have to, you know, recognize that 
we've we've significantly undercut for many many years things like addictions and um, you know of course education in particular but um, addictions and mental health have been areas that have not been significantly funded and we have unfortunately a lot of people you know ending up in a situation where had we been able to uh, have rather than a 911 police response and you know uh, some sort of a mental health response or an addiction response then we might have had a better outcome in a lot of instances so that's going to be one of the things that I'm going to be really pushing and trying to get people to hear and understand and move forward on in terms of how do we deal with this differently how do we put resources in a way that makes much more sense to uh, to support people who are struggling and rather than putting them into the criminal justice system and putting them in front of a, a situation that might get them hurt. All right, thank you, Representative Sanchez. The next question we have is from Mamadou Fall from PSU. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you um, to all the legislators that are here today um, with us. Um, I'm very glad to e meet you all again. And uh, my question is going to be about education. Um, I know we have um, I've been talking about um, you know police pr brutality and all that. But um, since we are in a caucus that talks about people of color, I think um, education is a big part of it. And we see that all the time education is undercut. That's the first thing that they that legislators or decision makers look at. Um, when it comes to cutting budget. And I would like to ask a question regarding to that because I think it's very important. But um, my question is gonna focus more on the international students level and the undocumented um, students. Because we are people of colors who live in this country. We pay a lot of money to go to school, but we always feel that we are always left out when it comes to decision making. And I wanna make sure to um, you know, make the voices of all the international students and undocumented students are heard because we are part of the conversation. And um, I think we are um, always left out. So my question is, does the decision makers in the state of Oregon um, think about international students and student, um, undocumented students? But again, I wanna focus my question in the international student level. Um, do you, think about them when it comes to taking decisions about them. Because I myself, um, I do not believe um, that, um, well, I feel like you, um, you are always left out and I would like to um, make sure that that question passes around. And maybe if we were not part of the process, maybe uh, to make sure that uh, it's gonna happen in the future. And if you are thinking about us, um, how are you doing it in the state level? Thank you so much. Senator Panning here, I'll jump in here first, if I may. Again, I got a little time to go. That is a great question. Uh, and, I, and to be perfectly honest with you, I view a student as a student. I don't look as a student being uh, international or uh, you know, being domestic. I look at a student that's in an institution here to learn and all are treated the same way. But you raise a good point though. Uh, something that I need to pay a little bit more, a lot more attention to. I'm interested in what are the, uh, the, the things that you are dealing with that are maybe uniquely different uh, than other students of color. Uh, certainly uh, you are uh, a student of color. So I'm uh, willing to meet with you or, you know, uh, if you have a group of students and to listen to some of the things that you are experiencing. It, it's, it's something for me that has not come to my attention as being uh, an, a, an experience that uniquely different than every other student, you know, a student of color. So, so uh, please moving forward and uh, we, we need, I would like to engage with you, hear more, learn more and find out what are the, the different uniqueness. Here's one of the things about me. I spent 24 years active duty army. And in my term, uh, my tenure in the military, uh, I, I had uh, camaraderie with people of uh, all nationalities around the world. 
And I didn't, when we were together, we were together. There was no separation in my mind. So when I look at the students, again, I see the students collectively. I know I am not naive. I know that students of color have a lot of obstacles that they deal with daily. But have I just, uh, I have not just kind of said that, well, these are international students, so they will be treated different in my eyesight uh, to others. I've not looked at that, but I'm certainly open and uh, I'll be reaching out. Everyone has know how to contact me and I want, I want to engage and carry on the conversation. And with that, I think that I might have to drop off unless anyone has any questions for me. I'll go next. Uh, uh, thank you, Mamadou, for that uh, very important question in respect to higher education. Um, so I am uh, the first Latina uh, chair of the education committee in the history of the state. I'm also an immigrant. I came here when I was a little girl. So I'm bringing a different lens than um, other chairs of education in the past. And um, those of you who know me and know the work that I've done, um, focusing on the student is very important to me. Right before we, um, uh, right before COVID happened, I was moving forward with establishing a student voice task force um, to help us legislators better understand the needs of students across the state. Now that opportunity kind of fell through because of COVID. Um, we are not able to visit all of the institutions or, um, or uh, regions the way we planned, but my office is uh, working on um, putting together a town hall uh, for students, um, university, community college, um, and high school students. Um, so you're, you all will be able to participate in the near future. We're looking at early July, I believe. Um, and to respond to your specific question around policies and what we think about, um, Mamadou, we absolutely need to do a better job at supporting international students. That um, I'm not aware of many uh, policies in respect to international students. So your voice is going to be very important um, when we put this town hall together. Um, you know, my office may be calling on you to sit on the panel. Um, we, we have um, passed some, some policies in respect to undocumented students. So in 2013, we passed House Bill 2787, which um, grants uh, in-state tuition. So uh, before you had to pay out-of-state tuition, which is a lot more expensive for students who lived um, in the state but didn't have a um, citizenship or green card. Um, in 2015, we passed Senate Bill 9932, which allowed for undocumented students to be eligible for, um, for state uh, financial aid um, and grants. Uh, so we were able to expand that to students. Um, and um, in 2017, I passed a law called the Cultural Competence uh, Policy which requires all public um, universities and community colleges to do a self-analysis and respect to cultural competence. And actually you all, I mean, you all helped um, uh, pass all of these policies. Um, and so you can be very proud of that. And all, all of the universities and community colleges have to uh, provide their reports by December. So that's gonna help us um, be better prepared for policies in, uh, in 2021 and definitely want you all to be involved with that process. Um, as the new chair of education, um, higher education is very important to me. It, my, one of my goals is to provide special attention on higher education because I see the value that it has um, on many of our diverse um, and um, uh, many of our diverse students, period, regardless of where you come from. Um, the, our, our institutions, I think with COVID, have um, highlighted uh, a lot of the inequities that exist and have existed for hundreds of years, um, but because of COVID, they're elevated now and we need to address them. Um, in, in, in respect to my chairhood, the focus that I am 
um, grounding the work we're going to do moving forward is that we are going to focus on a student-centered and equity framework. And that has never been done in the state of Oregon. Um, we, we have um, equity uh, policies in the K-12 system and in higher ed, but um, from a chair standpoint, this is new. So it's exciting. Um, we're going to really strengthen our, our education system across the spectrum um, because we're gonna center you, the student, and ensuring that we get you into the post-secondary opportunity um, and retain you and help you graduate and get a, um, the career job that you're working so hard and investing yourself to get. So that's, that's important to me, um, but I need your help. So hopefully you guys can join us at our um, town hall in um, early next month. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Alonzo Leon. Is there any other legislators that would like to talk about question? Sure, just briefly, if you don't mind. Uh, I have had to, I'm, I'm also, I'm a, the co-chair of the education subcommittee for the Ways and Means uh, um, Committee, which means we're the ones who look at the money. Uh, and uh, that's, that's important for you to know about. Uh, that's one of the, the processes that we deal with. Uh, Mamadou, I, I appreciate your, your comments. The fact is there have been some discussions regarding the support for um, international students. Uh, there was a significant um, uh, turn, uh, downturn in international students over the years because of the because of 9/11 uh, of, uh, and other and, and and the financial crisis that has created a problem. Um, and now with the with the COVID situation, people have not been able to travel, so they've not been able to go back and forth, and that's created its own set of problems. But there are also issues in terms of just support. How do we effectively support international students who are here? I think that's a question that we need some answers to from you, quite frankly. What is it that you really need? Uh, not, not what we think you might need, which is what often happens is that we decide, we think we know what, what's going on and we'll make decisions without you involved in the discussion. Uh, so it's gonna be important for you and other international students literally to come forward and say, this is what we need. This is the help that we need here in the state of Oregon. So if you can put something together that does that, that would be helpful. Now, the, the financial situation is dire. I mean, I, I don't expect that you're going to be seeing an increase in money or support right now because we have had, we have a financial deficit that is, that is huge. Uh, however, one of the things that has also been made clear by the chairs of the Ways and Means Committee is that we want to keep uh, education held as harmless as possible from the, from the budget cuts that are, that are coming, uh, and they are coming. So we, we will see a lot of discussion about how we do that. Uh, and I hope that you'll be part of that discussion. Uh, but we, will, we need to do that. Now, I, I say this, and a couple of people on this particular um, a call who have heard it earlier today, but I'll say it again. You folks are, in, the students are in a situation where you know you have, you have access to libraries, you have access to ideas, and you're smart. Well, I can't say that all of us are smart in the legislature or as smart as you, but we need to have some good ideas from you about what we can do, what, what, is, what will actually work. Um, and and we, don't, we don't have those right now. So I need for you to, to sit back and figure out some ideas. They're not all going to be adopted. Um, I, 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 that's just a reality there. But if we can find some, uh, some ways of, of walking through this system, it would be very helpful because next year we have a, a deficit that's even more difficult than the one that we have right now. And we're gonna to need to figure out some new ways of, do, of, of finding resources in the state of Oregon that we can work with. So let's be real clear, we don't have a military budget that we can call upon to, to bring in the money. We need to have other ideas from you about how we can handle this. So if you can come up with some ideas, that would be most helpful. But, um, uh, Mamadou, I'll go back to your, com 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 your, your comments. Again, we need to hear from you what it is you need and what we can do to support you. And if it's, if it's not money, it's, if it's something else, then let's try to do that, all right? Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Frederick, and thank you, Mamadou, for the question. The next question we have is from Johanna Pardo from Southern Oregon University. Hi, uh, how's it going? Uh, pronoun she, her, hers, um, the ASSU Director of Governmental Affairs and Chair of the Oregon Student Association. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts about how we can reduce, if not eliminate, the influence and obstructions of police unions when it comes to the firing and prosecuting of police officers? Well, I can start on that because the, my, my bill regarding arbitration is an, a, attempting to try to deal with some of that. Um, the, the issue that, that we dealt with with arbitration was that the, the, the union was able to um, actually support uh, a system that allowed arbitrators to overrule what was being done in terms of discipline across the, the state. And, and that's something that we, we, I think we will get changed at least at that level. It's not gonna, it's not gonna change everything. But I think that there's a the real question becomes how do we re how do we uh, take a a, 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 re, a re look at um, a reset on what we want to see from police officers and and how do we change them uh, the story that I have from Ashland is that Ashland area that is that you have a, a system where you have uh, peace officer bumper stickers on your on the cars there and they, one of my friends was down there and said that he talked with one of the officers and asked uh, the officer you know does does this change the way people respond to you and she said no it changes the way I respond to people that's a that's a change that, that takes place there and I think it's important it's not just a semantic situation I think we will begin to see as a result of all of the things that are going on across the nation and the world we, I think we're going to see a, um, a a requirement that we see a, a change in the approach that police and public safety people have to the community, not as an occupying force, but instead as a group that's that's determined to help and support the community in ways that, that, that make them non-military, but in fact make them a um, a part of the community. And that's gonna that's gonna take a lot of different things. It's not just a one bill, uh, like the arbitration bill, it's not. It's going to. It's going to take uh, changing, perhaps the uniforms, as I think Senator Manning mentioned, but also, um, also the uh, some of the other issues and the approaches. And the unions are starting to. Some of them are starting to understand that this is a, a radical change that they're going to have to go through, and that's going to be difficult for some of them. So we have to figure out how we work through that. I'd like to contribute to this topic and this question. Thank you, Joanna, for the question. And uh, the first of all, I'll let you know that I'm a, a very strong supporter of unions. I think they provide a very valuable uh, uh, resource and tool to our our workers. And it allows them to you know, be fully organized, get the benefits and things that they deserve and good, good paying jobs. But um, as you have mentioned, this, the police unions have become more powerful than actual legislators and the, the governing bodies of their communities. And um, I think if you look at the model of Camden, New Jersey, uh, the city of Camden just dismantled their full police force and they went to a county. Uh, and it wasn't just because it went from city to county, they just blew up the whole system. And part of the leadership, the current leadership of those unions and part of the leadership of, uh, or actually the um, leadership of the uh, police forces needed to be changed. And the whole mentality of what policing is all about needed to be changed. And, and it's more of a peace service, uh, not a policing service um, and providing safety to all of our communities so I think the unions are, you know, they uh, provide a very valuable role to our workers. Because as you all know, they're, they're really good, you know, police officers out there. But the question is fundamentally, who are we recruiting to be our um, officials that are um, working as peace officers in our communities? Do they have the proper uh, social skills and mentality to be working in the public? And uh, so there, there needs to be requirements for certain, uh, you know, mental health screening, training, uh, tolerance training. And um, so I think that we can, that uh, I've seen, if you look at the Camden, New Jersey uh, model, 
that they changed leadership of the unions. The union uh, are still, the police officers there are being um, represented by union and they're, they're, all their collective bargaining is still there. But the way in which they, uh, the enforcement, they enforce the law, the whole militarized, uh, I guess, uh, public view of them was changed. And so only through that will we be able to really truly start to change the way that the public interacts with our uh, peace officers. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Representative Meek, and thank you, Senator Frederick. Are there any other legislators that would like to respond to that question? All right, hearing none, Johanna, I know you sent me another question. We're gonna to get to a few more and then hopefully we'll circle back to the second one that you asked. Um, the next question that we have is from Sarah Kim. Is Sarah Kim on? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm a, a gra now a graduated undergraduate student from OSU, and I just wanted to thank the panelists and the organizers um, for this town hall and their time and sharing their insights um, with everyone. But um, I, my question is about um, basically defunding the police. Um, I'm sure a lot of us on this call have heard about um, defunding the police in terms of reallocating funds towards social services like mental health um, support, uh, housing, and job security. And I was wondering if university law enforcement, like the OSU police force, would be included in this conversation as well. Um, and I just wanted to hear your general thoughts on this. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll take that to some extent. I think we're going to see a, 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 another discussion of the police issues um, that that we we dealt with about four years ago. Uh, I think we'll see another discussion on that uh, coming up as well. Not in this short, in this uh, in this special session. This the first special session, and I really needed to make that clear too. We will probably have a second special session that will have more detail and more more bills available because they are not really available right now. Uh, some of them are not really av available to, to be uh, discussed right now, but there will be a second, a second special session. I think that if we do not do that in that second special session, I know that there are legislators at the highest levels of the, of the, the legislature talking about re, or, or rethinking or, re, or, or another, another look at the police forces on campuses and just what that means. However, you got to recognize that part of it is, uh, is 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 talking with the, especially on the on the campuses of um, the universities and the trues, um, is is that there's a uh, that they have their own boards that are supposed to be making decisions about that. So it's important for the boards to understand what it is you want to see as well before, perhaps before we make decisions at the legislative level. Can I, can I answer, give my uh, input on that? The, the policies though that we're putting forward, whether it's regarding use of force and uh, tactics training should apply to all uh, law enforcement uh, providers. And I, for example, I know that Oregon State University, I think they contract either with the city or with the state police, one or the other, I get them all confused, but. But uh, if a university contracts with the local law enforcement, those laws that we've provided or for protections for our citizens should definitely apply. So if we need to make amendments to that, uh, to make sure that these are um, applicable, that all of our university students deserve the same care and uh, protections that we're trying to provide with this uh, legislation. So that's just to answer that quick question. And uh, just regarding, um, yeah, definitely, the legislature does not fund any police departments. All of your taxpayer dollars go to each county and city municipality. And through those uh, channels are these, uh, pro are the law enforcement uh, agencies funded. So that's why it's important not only to be engaged at the state level, but you need to find out and, and uh, get engaged with your local level, whether it's city, county, as you may have just noticed uh, last week, city of Portland passed their budget, which included defunding some of the programs. And only through activism and making yourself known in a, 
and br bringing really good ideas and getting support from those council members, will you be able to allow our, and, and get the results that we're looking for of defunding certain programs and funding some of our other uh, community-based uh, organizations? So, so I'm, and uh, so your engagement is so important and I appreciate uh, this uh, venue today. Um, I, w I just want to add a little bit to what uh, Rep Meek mentioned. Um, you as students have the right to, um, to help make decisions around whether your institution um, should have police or not. So you as students can, you know, go to your um, uh, to your to the leadership there you guys can organize and um and say we don't want police in our in our um institution so you all have a lot more power than you think um and uh, make those requests as students who who attend your public institution so um so that that is an option for you you can make a request that you want uh, funding, you want to defund police in your public institution, and that you rather reallocate that money to increase mental health therapists, to increase um, wraparound services for, um, for you as students. So that is, that is an option you all have as well. Just wanted to underscore the importance of your voice and the things that uh, you want for your institution. So I want to chime in here a little bit. Um, one of the things we do, of course, fund is uh, DPSST, where those cops are trained. And I want to take a look at or have you all think about like, well, defund the police or defund certain parts of it or whatever. We're never going to dismantle this system completely. Like this is a very, very old system. So I'm try to be realistic about it. But what we can probably do is rework what we train them to do. You know, we can certainly say, you know, we don't as as different municipalities, we don't want the militarization of police. But we can also train them differently and say, you know, this is not something you get to do. I said one of the first questions I asked when I did a tour of DPSST is, um, well, uh, how do you do you do anything around, you know, you know, de-escalating. Do you, do you teach that? And they, they said, no. Well, do you do anything about implicit bias of folks coming in to the, to the institutions? Well, no, you know, that takes extra time. That takes extra long. Well, so why not then let's stop teaching how to, you know, play uh, military and stop teaching how to, you know, have these, you know, um, you know, the big military looking, you know, outfits and and games and let's let's you know run a uh, what do you call those darn things um a big military humvee around and we'll teach you how to de-escalate a problem rather than you know kill somebody how about we do that how about we retrain you know folks cops and those ones coming in in the future to do something a little bit differently rather than you know teaching them how to to be uh to be military experts and sharpshooters if they're not already you know army army folks you know we've got to do this a little bit differently we got to plan a little bit differently how we how we bring people in, into those institutions how do we do a psychological eval prior to coming into training right so that we're actually looking at somebody who's not really interested in power and control which is what oftentimes we end up with but who's more interested in making sure that the public is safe so that's where i'm looking at it I'm going to we'll jump in really fast, Gabby, if you don't mind. Um, uh, Rep. Sanchez just reminded me of something that we were having discussions on. Um, so you all also, uh, we need your brains, as uh, some of our uh, other uh, legislators have mentioned. Um, one idea that came from the community that was brought to my attention was this idea of increasing the uh, minimum education requirements. Um, Right now, if you right now um, in the state of Oregon, and it differs um, in different cities, but in the state of Oregon, if you want to become a police officer, you you um, can become a police officer with a high school a diploma or a GED. Um, and if you want to be hired by uh, any of our cities, they all have different requirements. 
Um, however, uh, a community member uh, brought this to my attention and said, Representative, I have an idea. We should have our police officers have more than just a high school diploma and a GED. Um, you know, he sent me some information. If you have more education, you're able to make better decisions, uh, better critical thinker. So that is something that the POC caucus is considering. Um, uh, as uh, some of the senators mentioned, we're not able to uh, put forth all these policies right now because we're moving at lightning speed. But the more ideas we're getting, we're going to start preparing for long session. And so um, this is something that we are highly considering for long session so we can do our due diligence and um, do some more research. Um, but if, thanks to this uh, community member, we now have a, a, a concept for 2021. And um, just as I tell all students when I go into the K-12 system, um, you all have also the power and the ability to share those ideas with us. You never know. Your idea who you thought maybe um, wasn't important enough or, or, um, or whatever um, could be a law that changes the lives of um, all Oregonians. So please, uh, I ask you to um, consider bringing forth ideas that might be really helpful. And um, you never know, the POC caucus may take your idea and, um, and work on it, and it, it may become law in, in 2021. These issues are really important. So thank you for allowing me to expand on my thoughts, Gabby. <laughs> Of course, Representative. Um, and just a time check here. I think that we are running short for any more questions. Um, but thank you so much for the legislators who have chimed in and given opportunity for people to engage with you all. Um, and a ground rule with the Oregon Student Association is expect unfinished business. So obviously, we're not going to come to all of the resolutions and ideas that will solve the problems to these issues at this town hall. But we really encourage the continued engagement. Um, to make sure that we can continue these conversations and stay engaged um, throughout the process. Um, so thank you again, members of the POC caucus and the legislature, and I will pass it off to Hannah. Hannah, you're on mute. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Uh, I did that last time I did an event like this. Okay, we're in France again. Okay, hello everyone again. Um, thank you legislators. As, as all of these legislators were saying, as all these wonderful people were saying, please reach out to them. Um, we have provided you the info to get to their information, um, to send them emails, to set up meetings. I'm also available. Our coordinator at ASOSU, the Associated Students at Oregon State are available. Um, we'll put our emails there to help mobilize students to help make sure that you're heard. That's like my passion is making sure that you are heard. So please let me help you do that or let anybody help you do that. Um, do it for yourself if you have to. Um, but I want to thank everybody for participating. Thank you for coming, making change, making your voice heard. That's very, very important. Thank you OS OSA staff for collaborating with my idea um, and uh, helping us make this happen and really helping us collaborate and getting all these students involved in this process. I want to thank my ASOSU team, um, which was our president, vice president, my coordinator, um, and then me. I also want to talk about the, we have a student story collection Google form going on right now. Um, Dylan, our coordinator, will put it in the chat, but that's for you to submit your stories about police accountability, your concerns about police, your concerns about policies surrounding Black Lives Matter. Um, that is a space for all students to make sure that you're being heard. Um, OSA and ASOSU will help submit those for you. All you have to do is tell your story. All you have to do is write down what you want people to know and we will do the rest. Um, and if you want to be more involved in that process, please let me know, um, I will help you out. And then we also have a link to OSA's newsletter, um, which will be another thing that you can get involved in. But I did just like, I really, I'm really excited to see all of you here. I'm really excited for the legislators to be working really quickly. And remember, this is a marathon, right? This is a long haul process. All the changes are not gonna happen overnight. So 
got to keep fighting, um, keep engaging, keep organizing, keep mobilizing. Go Beavs. Sorry, I'm a beaver, so. <laughs> Who's next? I think that's it. Oh, so um, here's my email, everybody, um, and you can reach out to me there. And then um, OSA's info is there as well. So thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Bye. Bye. Um, Y'all, there's a Google um, Google Doc that we can all, the staff and crew can all hop on after this. It's in run of show. So I'm going to end this meeting so we can hop on that. Cool? Cool. Release.